Well, I, first of all, I'm very pleased that you <laughs> recognize me. A guy out in the, outside the tent saw me and said, hey, Merv. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Phil, Phil and I were on the phone the other day, and, and when I found out that uh, Gorbachev was not coming, um, there was kind of three faces that came to mind, but two of them were these two guys. I really wanted Vladimir to come to the United States, and he was coming all the way from parts unknown. And it London. Was a, well, London, but you were in Russia before that. But the, <laughs> but the, um, but I was afraid he wouldn't come, so I, I called Phil and I said, Phil, you know, this is horrible news. And, I, and Phil, whenever we spoke about Gorbachev, would call him the great man. Like, then the great man, and I, and I so agreed with him, like, I wanted the great man. But we were on the phone and uh, Phil told me Vladimir's story. And my jaw dropped. Um, I could be wrong, but my guess is that Vladimir will not brag on himself the way he should. So Phil, I would like you to tell Vladimir's story and just how compelling this man's life is. Well, thank you. With Can my... I go now? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going you're gonna to correct me. All right. Um, Vladimir and I share, uh, we're about the same age. Um, I'm 77, you're in that neighborhood. 79. And. Um, he was born in Paris to a French mother and a Russian Jewish father. His mother was Catholic. And at age five, I should say that his father was a devout communist and worked for MGM and had this grand notion, uh, like his son Vladimir, he obviously a very ambitious man like me, and he had a notion of bringing America's film strategy to the United, to Russia. How they distribute, how MGM markets their products. And obviously a very bright guy and devoted uh, communist. So they arrive in the United States at age, at, uh, when he is five years old. Volodya is the diminutive. I've learned this along the way. A little Volodya comes to the United States and he goes to country and city and country city and country school in the village yep. and then to Stuyvesant High School. Now uh, comes 1948, 49, something in there and McCarthyism looms and obviously uh, his father would be a prime target. So they flee the United States having apparently connected already with the Communist Party. There is no apartment available for them in Moscow, so they have to go to East Germany, where uh, he leaves Stuyvesant High School and goes to East Germany, where Vladimir says he spent the worst two, three years, four, four years of his life um, on the other side of the Berlin Wall. They arrive finally, the apartment opens up and they arrive in uh, the early 50s, 53? 52. 52. December. And they arrive and was it the next day? The, Stalin dies. Two months. Two months later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> By the way, there's a fabulous review uh, in his memoir, which is titled Parting with Illusions. I recommend it to your attention. A brutally honest account of his own. The man has faced more moral dilemmas than uh, is really fair <clears throat> for one lifetime. Uh, and he goes to the, obviously he goes and he sees the body. He reports in his memoir how he stood there looking at the body of Stalin and he was staggered by how large his nose was. No, nostrils. Nostrils. <laughs> so if you don't remember anything else, remember that Joseph Stalin had large nostrils. <laughs> um, and he, <clears throat> he graduates from Moscow University. <clears throat> he now speaks three languages without an accent. French, English, Russian. And of course, along the way, he now, he's fluent in seven languages. And he is the son my mother wanted to have. <laughs> um, he, grad he, he becomes a, a journalist. He works for <laughs> Novestia, which one? Doesn't matter, really. And, um, and then the highlight of his life 
happens in 1985 when he meets Phil Donahue <laughs> on, <clears throat> on the satellite for a space bridge, which you may have been here for. Uh, and of course, I'm not sure who is this Posner. And I look up and I see this. And I tell you when I first, uh, I did check him out. Is he a KGB? Is he a spy? Is he an apparatchik? Who is this guy that I'm going to do a show with and everybody's going to say what a stupid, dupe, liberal, pointy head I am for essentially uh, co uh, getting uh, into a, a business enterprise with a, with a communist. And I watched him. Because I've, you know, I've done, we'd, I did over 5,000 shows. And I would run around the studio because time was very important. And, you know, I would never saunter to a person who wanted to have a, ask a question. Because that's dead air. And you don't want dead air on television. Come on. You got all these people watching, let's go. And I would run back. And, and in the early days, there were no wireless microphones. So I had a live wire. And I would run to the back row and strangle three people in the front row. <laughs> and I often tripped, often, you know, trying to get over. And I looked up in the middle of the space bridge and Vladimir fell down. Mm. And I thought, well, now, <laughs> you're a partner, <laughs> you know. And uh, it, was, uh, it was the following year, uh, 1986 that Vladimir finally got off. He was in the Soviet Union for 38 years, not, and had no permission to leave. Uh, he did have, permission came down once. He was going to go to Canada. And of course, he's thrilled. Imagine this guy, you know, bright and enthusiastic and ambitious. He's going to go to Canada. And he criticized his government out loud for invading Afghanistan and they cut him off. He was not able to go to Canada. And he's very honest. It's a brutally honest memoir. He drinks, becomes depressed. You know, he's wandering around wondering who he is and how this happened to him and why isn't he free to go. And he's got friends in other parts. Of, he's the only man in, he's the only person in the entire Soviet Union who knows who Joe DiMaggio is. I mean, this is a very fascinating arc of a, of a biography. And suddenly comes the opportunity for the Space Bridge. And in 86, he gets off the plane at JFK. First time out of the First Soviet time Union. since uh, they left, since he left Stuyvesant High School. And I mean, you can only imagine what this must have been like. And he comes right to 30 Rock and is a guest on the Donahue Show. Wow. So he, he walks out. <laughs> so you figure that. What? So then you met this fabulous guy, Donahue. And tell us, what were your feelings there? I remember you in your book. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You talk about, you were really, what? New York. You were glad. Y-A-W-K, you spelled it in your book, and you imitated the accents, you yeah. knew the Brooklynese, you knew all that. Yeah. So now you're here after 38 years, wow. Well, I dreamed about it many, many times. I dreamed about, it's not easy to say, it's, uh, it's tough when you're not let out of any place. And I was, New York was my home where I grew up, paper route. And um, I dreamed many, many times about how I was back in New York and I'd knock on somebody's door, ring the doorbell, and they'd open it and I'd say, hey, here I am. You know? And when finally I was able to leave, thanks to Gorbachev, when everything changed, when leaving the country was no longer a problem. You didn't have to have the KGB okay it, which is still the case. People can travel as much as they want, provided the other countries give them a visa. Now it's the other way around. But anyway, 
I was, I was on, on that plane, I, I really didn't know whether this was a dream again. And I'm not exaggerating. And when finally that plane landed, and I had a limo sent by a guy called Phil Donahue to pick me up. I'd never been in a limo in my life. This long car like this. And uh, we drove, and I saw the skyline. Um, it was uh, quite something. So, drove to the, what the hell was that Swiss hotel on 56th and Park? Drake? Drake, yeah, you had Drake. a, yeah. So I would, came to the Drake Hotel and changed and ran out to the streets. And I was kind of like saying, hey! <laughs> <laughs> Nobody reacted, you know. <laughs> but that, you know, it, it, it's unforgettable. It was just this unbelievable, unreal. I kept saying, don't wake up. Knowing that I wasn't dreaming, but still. And then, of course, Donahue show. I thought, you know, how do you get dressed for this? I'm, you know, I had this incredible yellow silk suit. You're not going to believe this. <laughs> and I had a lot more hair, you know. And anyway, so I must have looked really weird. But anyway, <laughs> there I was, and my good friend was asking me all kinds of nasty questions. You know, are you Jewish? Oh, no, no. He said, you're Jewish. And I said, that's what you say. Very defensive. Were you bar mitzvah? No, and I, I said, my mother was a French Catholic, so I can't be Jewish, right? And my father, yeah, he was Jewish, but he didn't want to be Jewish. He was, he was an atheist. He, did, he didn't speak Yiddish, let alone <laughs> Hebrew, and he, he considered himself to be a Russian intellectual. So how can I be Jewish, said I. And Phil said, well, you were bar mitzvah. I didn't know what it was. But I said, no. I thought it was something I shouldn't have been. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell them the uh, Shimon period. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, let okay. me, I'll get to that. You'll get to that. Right. All right. Anyway, so <laughs> there I was, I'm really. Um, and then I told you yesterday about at the end, when I was asked whether I, was, I believed in God, and I said, no, I'm an atheist. And everyone gasped as if I said I ate children for breakfast. And, <laughs> and after the show, a woman came up to me and said, Mr. Posner, when you're in America, Never say you're an atheist, just say you're an agnostic. People will think it's a religion and it'll be fine. <laughs> but what happened at that show was I suddenly, you know, I didn't want to be Jewish. And that was my father who would, you know, you don't want to be Jewish, not for any specific reason. I mean, look, when I was seven years old in New York City, two kids stopped me, two, they were bigger than I was, and they said, are you Jewish? I didn't even know what it was. I was seven years old in New York, and I said, none of your business. That's what I, when I'm scared, I get very aggressive. <laughs> and one kid said to the other, let's pants him and see. <laughs> Why would they take off my pants? I didn't know what this was about, but I ran. And I ran, and I ran around the corner and smacked into the belly of a big Irish cop. In those days in New York, all the cops were Irish. And they were all big. And he just grabbed me. He said, what do you have? And I was crying. And these two kids came. And he dropped me, and he picked them up like this. Because they were, they were Irish, it turned out. And he knew them. And he knew their, their father so-and-so and so on. This thing about Jewishness it was I just didn't want to be Jewish. With this show, <clears throat> it really turned me around. I felt so stupid. You know, uh, no that, in a way, it changed my life because I came to terms with it. No more problem. I still don't know what it is to be Jewish. I really don't. And you can tell the story. He's on a boat. He's at a dinner with uh, Shimon Peres. And <clears throat> he says to Peres, 
My mother was a French Catholic, and my father is a Russian Jew. So what am I? No, and I'm, I'm living, I was born in France, and I'm living in, Amer I'm living in the Soviet Union, and I don't know who I am. Could and, you help me? And, uh, and Perez says, well, if you are not sure who you are, you are probably Jewish. <laughs> So, at this stage, when you arrive, politically, what are you? Are when you a I communist? Arrive where? When you arrive at, at, and you go to Phil's, ah. would you call yourself a communist? Would you call your, what would you call yourself? Well, my father brought me up with a profound belief in, in the ideals of communism. And if you look at them without prejudice, they're great. It's about true equality. It's about rewarding people for what they do. Honestly, it's about not being poor, not being rich. It's a, it's a whole, and it's idealistic. And it turns out it's not possible, I don't think. But that's the way he brought me up. And I profoundly believed in it. And I knew that there was no communism in the Soviet Union. And it's strange that people should talk about communism in the Soviet Union. They, there was socialism at best. Communism was way down the road. And of course, never happened. And I believed in the system and I fought for it. I was a propagandist. When people say I was a journalist in the Soviet Union, that's not true because there was no such thing as journalism. Because if journalism implies that you're there, among other things, to blow the whistle and to tell people, look, that's wrong, or to, warn, or to tell the government, you're not doing what you should be. You couldn't do that in the Soviet Union. What you were, you, journalists were called Officially, soldiers of the ideological front. You were there to explain and support the policies of the Communist Party. Couldn't be a journalist. And basically what I worked, what I did was, I worked for the equivalent of the Voice of America in Russian. So beamed to the United States. So in Russia, nobody, in the Soviet Union, nobody knew me, because it was for over there. And I did that with joy, because I was trying to explain to Americans what the Soviet Union was about and what was good about it. Because I, and I was good at that, because I'm pretty good at talking. I was speaking American English that people could really relate to. And I believed in what I was saying, and that's really important. But gradually, I began to see that what I wanted to believe in wasn't really there. It's very painful, you know, when you, when you really want to believe in something, and you do, and then gradually you begin to see that, that your belief is misplaced. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing. And you, you try to find ways to explain, yes, but, yes, but, yeah, but. And finally, in 1968, when if you remember that, when the Soviet Union invaded or went into Czechoslovakia. Uh, that was pretty much when the first real crack in my ideology appeared. And I found ways of you know, justifying it, but gradually. So by the time I came uh, in, in, in uh, 86, I was no longer a communist. Or even, I, I, I no longer believed in socialism. I can't say I like capitalism. I don't. I think it's a terrible system. It's not a just system. It's not. You, you know, throw people out. People have no jobs. You know, how, I mean, you know, I, I have three citizenships. I have US, French, and Russian. So when I say my country, there, it's three. And I feel I can criticize any one of them because they're mine. And that's what, what, for me, patriotism is to look at what's wrong and not about what's so good. As a journalist, I say this. And when I see a country like America so wealthy, and I've traveled throughout it. I did a 16-part documentary on America. I've seen poverty in this country that I couldn't believe. How could it be in this country with its wealth? And that's part of what capitalism is everywhere in the world. I don't like it. But the idea that I believed in is just a pipe dream. So would you say Phil's more of a commie than you are? 
<laughs> Undoubtedly. I'm kidding. So, uh, so am I. Yeah, um, okay, but what, what you just described, you know, I, I think it would be difficult for us in the United... We haven't experienced that type of a change, um, but you are talking about something that borders on a religion. You're talking about the death of a belief of a group of people who passionately believed in this notion. And, you know, there was a period of time, but are we, are we talking about a devastating time of loss of a belief? And, and how does that manifest itself today? Today, are there people who say, we never should have given up on that? Or yes, there are. Okay. There are. But by and large, you had a nation that did believe, by and large. You had a very small number of people who were later called dissidents. But they were like one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent. In America, they were big because that's what the papers wrote about, that's what you saw on television. But they didn't represent anybody, not really. And the belief was like a kind of an epoxy glue, because it was belief and fear. And that's what held the country together. And people sacrificed. They sacrificed for tomorrow. They, you know, my son, my grandchildren will live better than I will. That's why I'm ready to do all this. And when, when ultimately they were told, well, it was all for nothing. It was all a lie. Mm. What happens to people? I mean, if you are religious, let's say, very, and finally, and, and you've lived a life because of that belief, and finally it is proven that there is no such thing as God, what do you do? Some people commit suicide. Some people say, all right, you lied to me my entire life, I'm going to get even. I don't care about anybody or society or anything. I care now only about me. And that's all I'm going to work for. Others, and that's why, say, when all this happened, suddenly in Russia there was no more Soviet Union. You found there was gangsters everywhere. There was violence. There was huge uh, drug problem, and there is today, uh, alcoholism. It's a terrible blow. And you do have older people who look back with nostalgia on the Soviet Union and say, we should never have gone this way. Because yes, life was tough, but we, had a, we thought we had a future. And we were a superpower. And who are we today? We're nobody. And thank heavens for Putin, because he's brought us back a little bit. Because now you have to respect us. You can't just say, oh, the hell with the Russians. Uh, as you were saying during the Yeltsin years, you say, ah, the Russians, forget about them. There is that. And that's why, incidentally, today there's much more anti-American sentiment in Russia than there was in the Soviet Union. But do, you, okay, but do you think, though, I think what we have in America right now, more than in years, is screw Russia. Right. And I mean, the, there was a and moment the feeling, where... And the feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not conducive to anything, really. No, it isn't. It, what does it do? <clears throat> why screw Russia? Let me ask you something. You know, the Russians, there's no democracy, there's no this, there's no that. Well, why don't you compare it to China? Now, that's really no democracy. There's no elections, there's no freedom of speech, there's no freedom of the press, there's no, no nothing. Where's criticism of China? Why isn't China the villain? The Syria thing, who's blocking it? The Russians. What about the Chinese? They're voting with the Russians against any kind of, you know, and nobody says anything about the Chinese in this country. Why? Well, because of money. Because so much is invested in China. Because the United States owes China big money, because China's bought bonds. So where is the principle? Where is the ideal? It's all about politics. But I so why screw the Russians? Why not say screw the Chinese? Well. I don't know, they're not screwable, I guess, right? Well, I do, but I would say, I would say that I think it is in part um, the memory. Putin looks to us like one of those old mean guys. And he acts like one of those old mean guys. And I think it, just in the sense of style, he presents a challenge for us. Right or wrong, I'm not agreeing with it, but he does come across in a way that reminds us of bad times. Oh, I know about the old mean guys. He's not old. And he's not any meaner than, than George W. Bush. He may not be. Well, in, in my opinion, he doesn't look any, and you know, yes, because he, he stood up in Munich and he, 
he basically told the West, specifically America, as they would say in London, piss off. Yep. We've had enough of this. We are no, don't think that you can push us around anymore. When you decided to bomb Serbia and we said, please don't do this, you said, ah, forget about it. Well, now we're back and he's not pleasant. I agree with you. And are politicians pleasant? I don't know. I don't know any real pleasant politicians and I don't trust them. I don't care where they come from because what they're mainly interested in is power. And I don't like that. But you revert to the Cold War mentality or psych, whatever you want to call it, because of the media. It's media that does the job, that, shows you, that tells you, aha, you see, they're going back to being what they were, and in <coughs> Russia, it's media that does the job. They look at the Americans, look at what they're doing. They're well, both guilty. Evil empire. We believe this. I know. Uh, and you lived behind a curtain that was made of iron. And we prayed for your conversion. We have God and you don't. Well, now we have God big time. And that particular church, the Russian Orthodox Church, is very Western, anti-Western, and very anti-American, and very anti-Western quote-unquote values, such as uh, the freedom of the individual and freedom of speech. All that is Western decadent. Uh, uh, all that is something we cannot accept. It is counter to the Russian soul, and that's the Russian Orthodox Church. So. The day after 9-11, I, I finally, this stereotype of the evil empire and the Russians who march in lockstep started to deteriorate when I went there. I mean, I met a lot of nice people. Few, few, space bridge. The day after 9-11, <clears throat> the next day, the entire front of the American embassy in Moscow was covered with flowers. You know, if we can get past these uh, lifetime images that are ingrained in us, inside, I believe, in the breast of Mother Russia, speaks a a kind and loving heart. And what we as people have to do is get past all these, you know, Putin looks how he looks. He's not very, he is a kind of a charmless guy, I think, you know. But I you know, agree. Are we going to make a judgment about a nation because of that? Um, and why don't we? This is a very educated population. And imagine what we could do in Syria if we both reached out. Putin saved Obama. We were going to go blow up children to prove to Assad that you shouldn't blow up children or gas them. Uh, we have no respect for diplomacy. Huge headlines. Obama talked to the president of Iran on the phone. What a breakthrough is that? We spend two billion dollars a day on things that go boom. Two billion a day on defense. And it took a brave act of courage to talk to Romani, is it pronounced, uh, on, on the top? Rohani, yes. I mean, think about this. It's almost like we'd rather win a war than avoid one. Um, we've got a rootin' tootin' shootin' nation here. We've become a warrior nation. And it should concern everybody with children and grandchildren. I mean, we're spending 20, a billion dollars for submarines <clears throat> and two guys with pressure cookers close the city of Boston. Uh, you guys both respect the clock because you both have TV shows. Um, it's been a gift today to have both of you here. And, and, I, and, I, and I will say that um, two private citizens who, in an act of both courage, but I just think in an act of historic significance, created a conversation between two nations who shouldn't be focused on what Putin <coughs> looks like, et cetera. Um, thank you for coming all the way here. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this. Thank you. <laughs>